Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you to Elena for, uh, for having this. I think, yeah, let's give a round of applause for Elena. So, yeah, uh, not only is this a lot of work, but there's a lot of risk involved with doing something like this, too. So I really admire uh, Eleanor and her team for putting this together. And I think with, without these, we don't really have the community. And, um, you know, digital art doesn't grow the, the way it should. So very appreciative for her, uh, for her setting this up. So I'm Jason Bailey. Um, I, I run artgnome.com. Uh, it's a, a blog that talks about the intersection of art and technology. And I also uh, started a, a blog last year called The Dank Rarest Podcast that I get a lot of questions from older people about um, because of the name. But uh, that focused mostly on blockchain and art. And um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about AI art mostly, though blockchain may um, come up a little bit, and generative art. So one of the things that, that I've noticed um, as sort of, I'm a, a long-term art nerd geek, this is like, I got my, my master's in art and tech in like 2010 and grew up in a family of engineers. So this isn't a new thing for me, but it's exciting to see that other people are starting to care about this stuff. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to touch on today is that there's, before all of this AI art, there's been this long, rich history of generative art that a lot of people don't necessarily know about. And somewhat for selfish reasons, I'm seeing this window of everyone being fascinated in AI art as an opportunity to kind of force feed everyone the history of generative art um, because I think it's really important and we've got this opportunity to do it. So uh, I'd like to quickly introduce my panelists, but they'll kind of ex introduce themselves a little bit more as we kind of walk our way down the line. But we've got um, my co-curator for an upcoming show, Automat and Munch, uh, George Bach. We've got John Watkinson, who is uh, best known probably for CryptoPunks, but we're going to talk a little bit about autoglyphs and his partner in crime, Matt's, in the, uh, the second row there. Um, David Young, who is a, a, an AI artist, um, who will be talking about some of his work on the panel today. Sharon, who I don't know how to say your last name yet. Anlen. Uh, Anlen, all right. Sharon Anlen, who I met last Friday and is doing awesome stuff and changing my mind about AI art. And then uh, Kevin Abosh, um, we're panel veterans together, so excited to have you back on the panel. So uh, I'm going to start by sort of having a, a targeted question for each person. You, you can all weigh in on any of the questions, and then we'll kind of open it up from there to uh, a broader conversation. So uh, George, it, we're lucky to have him here. He's sort of a, a, an expert on early generative art, specifically um, in photography. So um, maybe help folks understand a little bit more about uh, where this all started and a little bit more about the history to give some background before we kind of go further down into the panel. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, generative art, that, is a, that was a movement in the, mainly in the 60s. And uh, generative aesthetics uh, is an expression uh, which was defined by our German philosopher, a mathematician named uh, Max Benze, who was teaching in Stuttgart. He was also later uh, teaching in Ulm uh, when uh, Max Bill has invited him to become a professor there. But he was very influential because he defined art as uh, something, well, it was a time when the first computers came up. And uh, so, artists were thinking about how can you create visual aesthetics uh, with uh, algorithms, with uh, computers, machines. And so he created this expression, generative art, and he talked about aesthetic states. So he was not talking about artworks. Now this is important because um, when you talk about generative uh, art, it's basically important to know that there is a program be behind it, you know, a program that uh, creates the art or a machine that creates the art. So you can basically recreate. Just a little bit closer, I think. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is that better? <laughs> is it better? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so we, we're talking about um, aesthetic states. And these are basically 
visual effects or, or visual artworks that can be recreated anytime just by using an algorithm or by using a machine that recreates them. Now, this was very interesting uh, at the time, and in 1965, two of the pupils of uh, Max Benze, um, they were two German uh, artists, Georg Nees and um, Friede Nake, they did an exhibition with a uh, Potter drawings which were made uh, on very early computers. Now, those artworks, uh, well, nowadays if, if we look at these artworks, we think, wow, it's just like a very simple print. But uh, at that time, these plotters which were printing these artworks, they took hours and hours. The artists didn't just have uh, access to these machines. They these machines were owned by big companies like uh, Siemens, uh, Bell Laboratories, etc., or universities. And so the artists sometimes just got access, for example, throughout the night to work and to print. And it took sometimes six hours to make a print, which nowadays takes not even a second. So, and they had to create their own programs and everything. So. In 1965, that was the first exhibition uh, in the history of computer art where those two artists uh, displayed their works in the University of Stuttgart. And later on, uh, there was a whole movement of, of early computer art uh, or generative art. And uh, in 1968, uh, there was a, some sort of a peak because um, a lot of artists um, wanted to display their work, so there was a, a show in London, for example, Cybernetic Serendipity, which you might have heard of. That's a, like a classic computer art exhibition, um, curated by uh, Ye I don't know how to write, uh, say her name, but it's Yezia Reichardt, I think, if I pronounce it right. And she, uh, she curated an exhibition uh, with computer art and um, uh, well, the, it was also, the, there were also artists who, who did uh, geometric art, kinetic art, etc. So that was a seminal show at that time. And at the same time, there was also a movement in uh, Zagreb, the so-called New Tendency Movement, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, a place where uh, a lot of artists met from Eastern and Western Europe, Europe and who were thinking about uh, computer art, about new aesthetics. Uh, it was very influential. So these were maybe the two most important uh, art uh, exhibitions at that time. Um, but also at the same time, there were the first magazines created, like the Leonardo magazine, which is a very important source for uh, early computer art. Uh, there was a magazine called Bit, Bit International. And uh, also in London, they, um, they uh, founded a, the Computer Art Society, which was also collecting art. And thanks to this uh, Computer Art Society, um, the VNA could uh, buy their whole collection. They, they have uh, preserved uh, a very important source of these early artworks. Now, my special field is actually generative photography, and um, that happened also at the same time. In 1968, there was an exhibition called uh, Generative Photographie. It was in, uh, in Bielefeld, in Germany. And uh, that was actually the first exhibition and manifesto where they used this expression generative. And uh, it was Gottfried Jäger, uh, a very influential and important uh, photographer who, who uh, showed uh, his works and also the works of Pierre Cordier, uh, Kil Kilian uh, Breyer and um, Hein Gravenhorst. And they were basically the founders of, of this art movement, which is now, in the last few years, they started to rediscover these artists 
I mean, they were quite <laughs> unknown for a long time, but uh, people started to realize that it was, this was the beginning of, of digital art, digital photography. And, um, well, I could No, speak. that's great, yeah. I, I think <laughs> Go on and on. A solid intro, and we'll probably come back to, to more of the history. But I think from, from there, there's a continuous history. It doesn't just start and then stop in the, in the you know, late 50s, early 60s. One of the pivotal points that, you know, I think got a lot of maybe the people that are here interested, um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, Flash comes along, action script, right? So artists... Uh, for the first time, don't have to be engineers to be able to start programming their, their own work. And then processing, uh, which is a, a programming language built by Ben Fry and Casey Reese out of MIT comes out, and then it just explodes, right? So people are using processing for data visualization and all kinds of art, and you can you know, hook it up to sensors and things like that. So I think um, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is uh, we'll, we'll ask John here. So, John, uh, how many people here know what a crypto punk is or what crypto punks are? Yeah? <laughs> Solid crowd. Are these like all your relatives, guys? Or? <laughs> um, so crypto punks is like a sneaky generative art. I call it sneaky generative art because you don't actually have to know what generative art is or even know that it's generative art to appreciate it. Um, but I think it's totally generative art. I'm going to ask you if you agree uh, uh, in a second here. And then they've more recently done this autoglyphs uh, project, which is actually a tip of the hat to a lot of the folks that George uh, was just talking about. So, John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, CryptoPunks, your thoughts on generative art, some of the influences for autoglyphs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so CryptoPunks is generative art. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, these works are generated by a computer program. I, think, I guess the unflattering way to describe it is uh, Mr. Potato Head, you know, or it's just like, <laughs> hey, all right, take a random face, you know, put a random hairdo on it, you know, that sort of thing. So it's. It's a very simple t type of, uh, of generative art, but that's how we got to be able to make 10,000 of them. Uh, and, and then, yeah, the real sort of uh, uh, important thing, I guess, we did there, that the reason we did it, that what mattered to us was that we, uh, we, we registered them, their ownership on the blockchain and made it so that the way you own these things was to control them via a smart, uh, a smart contract on, on Ethereum. And at the time when we launched it, we didn't know if anyone would, would acknowledge that as real ownership. You know, they, they, what does that mean? You know, anyone can download these things, look at them, do what they want with them. So does it matter if you, uh, if you own this little record on the blockchain? And, and the answer was happily yes, that people did care about it. And, um, and they sort of took off and they're still traded. Usually a few CryptoPunks change hands every day, uh, to, um, two years later almost. And uh, so that's, that's them. Um, then to speak briefly about autoglyphs, which I think have been rolling through on the slides here, that was our idea to kind of say, can we go even kind of deeper on this, on a similar concept and try to make it even more pure? And so what we did there was make the entire generation of the art happen within the blockchain, the, the, the smart contract. And um, people, I've, I've heard Ethereum and other blockchain uh, um, networks referred to as like the world's supercomputer, you know, people, and, but really it's, it's not that, it's the world's uh, punch card computer, you know what I mean? Like, you can do so little, it's so expensive and so time consuming to even do a very small amount of computation that in a way it really is a throwback to what uh, Georg was talking about where, you know, it's quite difficult to, uh, to, uh, to run these things, you have very limited resources. And so because of that, yeah, we thought, oh, you know, what can we do? Uh, with this very limited computing resource, uh, we can actually take uh, inspiration from what they did in a very similar constrained environment in the, in the 60s, and, and people like uh, Vera Molnar and uh, Michael Knoll and, and uh, some, of, some of the artists that uh, Georg mentioned. So, so Autoglyphs is definitely an homage to that, and, um, and we love the purity of that everything comes from within uh, that uh, smart contract environment. So the entire art is created sort of in public view by the... By the um, you know, by the participators in the network. So part of it's a hat tip, but part of it's just sheer limitation of the, the confines that you were working within, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, I mean, the entire generator is only about um, 30 lines of code, and it's, uh, I think I, we were limited to only seven variables that we, you know, it's, it's very limited, and and it still takes, it still takes almost an entire uh, chunk of, it, it uses more than half of, of what you're allotted to, uh, um, to fill an entire block on Ethereum. So, we're, and at the time when we wrote it, it was even closer to the limit. The limit pushed up a little since then. So, 
so yeah, it's, it, it was hard for us. It took us many iterations, and we even gave up for a while to try to make what we wanted within that constrained resource. So yeah, they were nice enough to let me write the uh, sort of the exclusive uh, article uh, about autoglyphs. And as much as I love generative art, like most people I talk to glaze over pretty quickly. So I was kind of like, these poor guys, nobody's gonna buy this stuff, right? So they put it out and within two or three hours, all 330 some odd were sold, is that right? Yeah, 384, yeah. Uh, there was 512 total, but we kept a quarter of them for ourselves uh, so we could make prints and do other things with them. Uh, and yeah, we were surprised at their reception uh, because it's just what you say. Um, we, we said this is pretty esoteric. These aren't nice characters anymore. These are, yeah, esoteric kind of unique little patterns. And uh, but somehow it, yeah, it struck a nerve and uh, it's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I think like you know that's what we're seeing. With, and, with, and we'll talk about the GAN stuff, the neural network stuff too. That, that that there is a bit of a coming out party for this generative art, and people are are it's. It's resonating more, I think, than it than it has ever before. I love it. This could be like our only shot to be cool, because you know I mean, we've been yeah. loving this stuff for so <laughs> long. So I'm sure that window. I'm just closing. like fingers crossed, please. So David, I, I I always smash AI art under generative art, but a lot of AI artists that I've talked to, a don't like to be called AI artists, and b uh, point out that they're sort of different. I think it'd be helpful, and I know this isn't easy, if you could help people understand. I tell people when people say AI art in the last two years, what they really mean is kind of GAN art, right? So these generative adversarial networks, which I can't really explain that well. Maybe you can help us understand a little bit what, what this AI art is that people are talking about. And, you know, I know, not easy. So when I did this in Bahrain, Robbie Barrett and Mario Klingman flipped a coin to see who had to explain it, because it's, it's just not easy. But I appreciate the, any help I can get there. Well, I appreciate the question. <laughs> and if you want, I can connect a laptop and bring code up on the screen for everybody to look at. Um, I mean, I, I think people don't really like the term AI artist because it's a little too specific. I think instead people would like to think of themselves first as artists and AI is the tool that we're using just as I'm not a, well, I guess you could say I'm a painter as opposed to an artist that uses paint. So, okay, so maybe I un unsay that. Um, but I think that, you know, AI, art using AI fits into a long history but that what's interesting now is how AI itself has changed over the last five years from what it was previously. So um, when I started my career, uh, I actually started in computer science and doing AI in the late 80s. And the AI in that era, before there was this kind of nuclear winter that kind of ended all the AI work that was happening at the time, was around sort of this notion of sort of top-down defining of rules. So expert systems were a big part of what AI was in those days. And so people were embedding rules into the code to kind of in some way embody expertise. And I think of generative uh, design or generative art as sort of similar, that generative artists were Im embedding rules into programs and so they were you know, generating the, the images based on this kind of rational approach to image making. Um, and then what happened most recently with AI in the last five or six years is the emergence of neural networks. And it's a really different notion of what um, AI is as well as what art made using AI is. So if you think of previous versions of AI or previous versions of generative art as being a kind of top-down approach um, where the, the programmer or the artist is sort of embedding rules into the system, the new notion of, of AI is around training. And so you may set up some kind of framework for the system to learn, and you set up what information you're feeding into the system, but what it, what it kind of learns, what it develops, is much more um, organic, sort of as the nature of a, a neural network, and much less um, understandable by the, by the AI team or by the artist. And so the work that emerges has a very different kind of quality. Um, and I, I sort of go back and forth between this is both AI in the industrial sense and also AI in the generative art sense. And so the works that come out in the, in the art space are, I think are much more, um, they, they're part of a tradition of generative art, but they're, they're also a bit of a break because it's a new type of expression that's coming out of it. No, I think that's really helpful in terms of the background. So it's not, AI didn't come out of nowhere, right? So it's, but people have been talking about AI since the, the 50s, I think. And it's just, its definition has evolved um, and now art's evolving along with it, right? 
Um, so I, you know, I might pass this question to the rest of the panel too, but one of the things I want to get back to you on is a lot of um, AI artists find these massive data sets online um, and train their work, you know, using huge amounts of data, and they're constantly racing for what I call uh, firstism, which is like to plant the flag and be like, I use big GANs first, or I use this first. And I think you've got a slightly different approach, but maybe we'll come back to that um, and, and kind of catch all three AI artists. Sure, that. yeah. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so, Sheeran, uh, we talked on Friday. For anyone who reads Art Gnome, um, I have sort of like this personal vendetta uh, against anthropomorphization, which is probably not even a word, of AI. Um, I feel like, so I, I, I didn't say it in my intro, but I worked for a, um, a machine learning and AI company based out of MIT uh, for the last four years. So even though I'm a nerdy art marketing person, I've been around legit um, you know, machine learning folks from MIT and Harvard for the last four years. And watching them try to do anything with AI, it's like it's embarrassingly simple, or like the embarrassingly simple stuff is really hard to do with AI. But then I come home and I like read the news and it's like, all our jobs are gonna disappear next year. And like, you know, all the artists are getting replaced by like autonomous, um, you know, robots or whatever. And none of that's true and it drives me crazy, right? Because there are actually these AI artists that are doing like remarkable things, but we never get to the nuance of what they're doing because everyone wants to have a debate about whether or not robots are taking over the planet with art, so it's, it's frustrating. So then when I was talking to Sheeran, and she was like, oh, well I look into sort of the intersection of emotions and AI art, and I'm like, no, please don't do anthropomorphization or whatever, but um, immediately was excited when you started explaining your work because um, I think you opened my mind, you're saying, well, you know, for some reasons that you'll probably share, you've had to think about emotions in sort of a structural, almost programmatic way, um, and now that you're thinking about AI, as AI evolves, do we want to carry everything that we know or think we know about our minds into these models that we're building? And can it cause us to reevaluate things like, uh, you know, mental illness, right? So what does that look like um, in AI? So I'd love to have you share a bit more about that. I think your work's fascinating. Uh, yeah, it's funny that the only woman here is speaking about emotion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll talk uh, about emotions too later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, so what I'm researching is about the possibility of mental illness in AI, and I'm looking at uh, what happened between input and output, and the distortion between there. And uh, I think it's what makes us human is like, and me being happy to me being sad, something happens there. And I'm looking at that in the machine. And I'm exploring different kind of machine learning models and looking at error, bug, and glitch and asking whether that can evolve to some kind of mental state. And maybe that's all already kind of like um, a hint for something that can evolve to, if it will be like independent thinking entity, what kind of independent thinking entity, uh, uh, a dysfunctionality of thinking independent thinking entity will grow out of that. So that's my question. And I'm looking at that. Um, from the art point of view, although it sounds really a hardcore uh, technical question, I'm, I'm speculating about the possibility of that, and I'm looking at GAN, for example, was my first uh, network that I explored, and I speculate what kind of mental illness GAN will evolve to have. Uh, so I, I, I start really big, and I, I immediately diagnosed it as a schizophrenic because he, had <laughs> <laughs> he has uh, two networks that he he compete with each other, like one is constantly debating what is real and the second one is constantly uh, generating new image and fake image. But then I, I, uh, I had a chance to exhibit uh, a prototype of this project, so I, I created a prototype that exploit in a small uh, assumption of like GAN has, um, GAN generate fake memories of a fake family and the data set that we trained was about on a perfect family data set and the user came and played the perfect family but the GAN viewed them through the perfect family data set and actually the distortion was, the results were very distortion and the story through the text, that, this is an example but we, we developed a text to image that as the user speak, GAN is trying to understand what they're saying and he view them through the data set of the perfect family data set and it was a kind of a room that evolved through the generative sound and everything was created through generative GAN model. So the room was embodied, trying to teach 
about what is gun actually and how we can embody that. So yeah, to it's not really a, a spiritual uh, statement. It's really very grounded statement about how we can broaden the conversation and bring more people to understand what is machine learning. And the next one is like reinforcement learning models. So I'm exploring different kind of machine learning. Uh, that's great, thank you. Yeah, and I think um, you got me to change the way I think about AI and art more than, than a lot of people recently, so it was a good conversation. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Kevin, um, I think a lot of people know you as a photographer, sometimes as the guy who um, sold the million dollar photograph of a potato uh, or the forever rose. I think of you as a conceptual artist. Um, and. I think you use a lot of different tools to get your points across your more conceptual points. Um, you've done a lot of work with blockchain and you're, you're starting to do some work with AI that um, folks can see downstairs, so the, the works around the nails. Um, what is it that got you interested in looking at AI as a tool and would you agree with my assessment that these tools are just tools and really you use the ones that best express your point? Sure. Uh, so, so I mean, I, I've essentially been an artist my whole life, but uh, I also have this uh, dirty secret as a technologist. And in 1989, 1990, I was exploring some of these expert systems that you spoke about. Uh, uh, we call it. We didn't call it AI. We called it fuzzy logic, and uh, you know, so fuzzy logic plus some uh, crude computer vision. Uh, I was using to analyze pap smears uh, because there's a, 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 there was an inordinate amount of uh, false negatives coming back for cervical cancer from women. It was a, it's a real practical issue. Um, and, uh, but this was, you know, we, and the limitations at the time were, as they are today, all about uh, processing power. Um, so, you know, I've always said that uh, for me the most in, in, exciting place are, is the intersection of art and technology when it, when it works for me. Um, my work is about identity and value and existence, and uh, I, I'm always using my subjects as proxies to distill emotional value. Uh, I, I, with the blockchain, I was able to do that too. I use these alphanumerics uh, as, as, these proxy, as a proxy, usually to, to sometimes even a secondary and, 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 and tertiary proxies uh, to distill value. Um, AI, uh, in the, in the you know, form du jour with GANs, with these adversarial networks, is, is particularly interesting to me. I'm not interested in training on these public data sets you talked about or uh, data in the wild, but creating my own data sets based on my own work. Uh, if, if I can, uh, I, you know, I'm always interested w if I photograph you or a potato, for instance, where do I end and where does my subject begin and vice versa? It's really interesting when you consider, when you're, let's, say we're collaborating with an AI not to anthropomorphize it. Yeah, maybe that's not a word. Um, but anyway, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, where do I end and where does the uh, AI begin? And when it's training on my own work, so in the, the downstairs you see some little photographs of uh, little one and a quarter inch uh, nails, the kind you hammer into a wall, they're, they're bent because um, uh, what, what I did was I, I took 200 of these, hammered them into wood, uh, pulled them out, made sure they had a little bend in them, and then those photographs, I trained on those. The resultant generative output, this generative photography, which also starts, to, you, you have to ask, like, what's, is, it, is it a photograph? It, it's not computational in the, in the kind of traditional computational sense, but generative based on these GANs. Um, I look at it and it's me. I, it, it's more me than me, I'd argue. It's, uh, and that's really exciting, is I feel like it's me plus some sort of insight. And that's what it's about, using this uh, AI to glean insights uh, that I might otherwise not be able to. Um, so yeah, for the moment, uh, I'm, on the, I'm on the GAN bandwagon as well. <laughs> <laughs> on the GAN train? <laughs> toot toot, on the GAN train. <laughs> um, so here's a question for everybody. I guess this would be a discussion question. Um, so with, with both traditional generative art and, and with GAN art, um, what is the art? Is the art, and I, I get a lot of different answers to this, is the art the output or is the art the system or the code or whoever wants to, to take that to try to kick that off, it would be great. What are people, if people want to buy, you know, generative art or AI art, should they be thinking like, oh man, I really want the code or I want the output or how do you guys think of that as the artist, you know? Uh, I'll say for the more traditional generative art where it is just a simple, you know, a, a, a discrete algorithm that generates the work, uh, th there's some trade-off there, right? Obviously, if uh, if you just had the code 
and you don't run it or anything or you don't use it, then that's certainly not what the work was intended. You know, you, you were intended to see the output. But then again, if you have something where you can just generate an infinite number of them, at some point, you know, the million and tenth one is not really the art anymore. You know, you, you, you know it's, it's like you can't, it's not infinite that way. So I think it's, it's a weird combination of, of definitely, you know, the, the, the code is the art and what it generates. You know, those together kind of form uh, uh, the result. And, and, you, and you, they always have a limitation. You know, you can, you, once you've made a certain number of them, then you, you just kind of know what to expect and you don't, you're not going to be surprised anymore. So, so I think, and certainly in the traditional stuff, I, you know, I think that, that the algorithm is, you know, is the work. That's what the, that's what the artist made, but then it's, you know, then it's expression, the, the, the way you experience it is with what it makes. I don't know if that's helpful. I can barely relate to that. I totally appreciate it and respect it, but from, from where I'm coming from, that's, that's really interesting because I don't relate to it at all. The, the, the code is this tool, it's like buying a paintbrush or, a, or some medium, and, uh, uh, especially like in some of this AI work, I'm not looking for, I'm not trying to win a Nobel Prize in science or technology, uh, you know, with, with creating the, the most kick-ass algorithm. I'm actually looking at taking algorithms, tweaking them, breaking them, uh, and, and, and using them as a method to make art. Uh, I'm also not interested in making two million iterations of something. I might only be interested in making ten. Mathematically, perhaps what I'm doing breaks down. If I, maybe if I tried to make that eleventh one, I'd realize, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a bullshit algorithm. Uh, but yeah. yeah, that's interesting that you. Well, say yeah, that. and especially if it's open source, right? If you're doing things in an open environment where you're giving out your code, then other artists will be will take that code and and do things with it. You know, so really, you know, like that also I think elevates the code as as being more core to the art if if you're working in that environment. You know, so the autoglyphs that code is open source and people can take that change it, adjust it, or just run it again, yeah. they can do what they want. Jason, I just want to pick up on, the, on a previous uh, talk about uh, open source code. Uh, I, I think we're all using stuff that at, at some point was either open source or from somebody else, and we're, we're messing with it. And uh, there seems to be some discussion around, is that ethical, is that, uh, you know, should we be monetizing other people's works? So it's like near impossible to figure out uh, where to stop it, right? I think a lot of people in the audience may or may not know about the Robbie Barrett piece. So the obvious piece that was sold by Christie's end of last summer for $450,000. It was heavily, 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 heavily based on Robbie Barrett's work, um, which was open source, right? So I don't think there's an opportunity for like a lawsuit there. But like our, the, the court of public opinion was basically like, well, this is bullshit, right? But that's not unique. It happens pretty much if you're a nerd on Twitter with no life who like looks at this stuff all day like me. It happens pretty much weekly, um, you know, and I, I think there's maybe precedent for it in software where we've had open source software for a while. And, you know, do you give, how far up or down do you give credit? Should you give credit to the person who makes the graphics card or the person who, like, makes the monitor? Well, maybe that seems silly, but what about the guy who wrote the algorithm, right? So, I don't know, David, do you have thoughts on, on that? I mean, I would sort of echo what has already been said, that a lot of the code is um, public domain, um, in part because in the AI world, you know, in the business world of AI, what's valuable is the data not the code. And so it's easy for companies like Google or Facebook to make the code available because they're the ones that own the data. And so, you know, if anything, what we're doing is we're kind of taking sort of variations of that code or a code that's from the same spirit and then feeding it, you know, content that's our curation. Um, and then likewise, it's spitting out, you know, depending on how we work, hundreds of thousands of images. And, you know, our job is sort of one of curation sort of like a photographer with a contact sheet that doesn't say every single photo that they take is, is the one that they want to put out into the world, but to go through and kind of curate what we put out. Yeah, that makes sense. Sharon, do you have anything you want to add on, the, on that front? No? No, I totally agree. Uh, but I do have a question. Do you work with, as open source as well? Do you bring back? Like, contribute? Yeah, contribute, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so who, who, the question is, like, who on the panel contributes to open source in addition to just using it? Uh, I don't. Uh, at this point, probably because I don't think I have much to offer. Um, I am working on some things that I think are pretty clever, and if they work out and they, they prove themselves to be as clever technically as I think they are, which has nothing to do with my art, actually, then I, I, I might feel some obligation. I don't think it has to be cle clever, you know? Like, we are in the middle of the point, like, we can just contribute together to the to the effort of making it like social and community and like work together to make it 
better. I get that. I appreciate it and yeah. respect it. I'm just not sure. I'm I'm the type of artist who wants to collaborate with yeah. the masses. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I add to that? Yeah. I mean, I th I think you know I'm in a similar position as Kevin. It's like I don't I don't think I'm doing that much to the code yet. Yeah. Although I've also just started to learn how to use GitHub so that I can you know check in and check out um, code. Um, but I think part of at least for for me what I'm um, embracing in my work is that you don't need to be an expert to do this stuff with AI. That you know, it's it's such an important part of what the future of our world is going to be. And for us to say that technical proficiency is a requirement to engage in what that future is is sort of too big of a barrier, considering how important it is. And so, what I'm embracing is the notion that you can just take something that's open source off the web and do something with it. And you don't have to be an expert at it. I mean, you have to kind of know how to set up a, a, an Amazon instance and all that stuff. But uh, you don't have to get super deep into the code in order to start developing, you know, your own intuition for what AI can be. So I'm just wondering what the traditional analog is to this particular, uh, you know, subset of artists who are somewhat techn technically proficient, and there, there sometimes is this hierarchy amongst uh, tech artists. You know, well, he doesn't write his own code, or he's this, or she's that, and you know, um, and which is, gets kind of nasty. I actually really like to stay out of that. Uh, no, yeah. that, that's not what I meant. No, no, like, I know, I know. like open source can be like, I, I, write, I write a blog post about what I did and I share what I learned. Sure, you know, sure, open sure, source sure. Is, a, is a state of mind. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. have to be like, yeah, you yeah. have to commit new code to yeah, GitHub. Yeah, no, it's no, just yeah. sharing kind of yeah, how yeah. you're doing you things like the community. You asked like, if like, uh, I don't know, it came out of the conversation if we use open, uh, open source code, if we like, it's allowed or what we think about it. So I was wondering if we bring back if we're using that, yeah. Okay. John, do you, do you want to weigh on yeah, yeah. open source at all? Well, just in our work, we don't have a choice. You know, we're not running the, the, the code. It's run on the blockchain, so it has to be open source. And so it, it was one question, you know, you know with, with the autoglyphs, because they're all generated there, someone could just take that code and copy it and run it and make as many as they want, and they would be, you know, they, that could happen. And I don't, I don't think anyone's done that, and I think obviously if they did do that, it wouldn't be the official ones or anything, but it's interesting that that's, that's possible, that we, we limited it to, to 512, but that's an artificial limit. You can just take the code and do what you want with it. Hasn't happened yet, but... Uh, when it does and they sell it at Christie's for a big boatload of cash, are you gonna be upset? <laughs> yeah, anyway, we'll see. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I planted a seed. Uh, well, I think sellability actually is part of the problem. So open, I learned uh, how to use processing because there's this great community around um, open source and teaching people how to code. I was, I'm a dumb artist, but I learned how to code because there's this great community, right? But now that the, we're seeing the prices go up through the roof, now people are starting to say, like, maybe we don't want this so open source anymore. So maybe my question for you, George, would be um, sort of this sellability part. You know, you've got experience as a, a gallerist, and you and I are working on this show coming up with generative art and AI, and especially the younger artists, they don't want to print anything out, but we are a commercial gallery show, right? So it gets complicated, right? Yes, but I, I think um, we have to look back a few years. Um, in 2015, I believe, there was uh, actually a, an auction at Artsy where they were selling pure coats, <laughs> which is quite interesting. And, they were sold for like uh, $20,000 or something. And, and all of the codes were sold, all of them. And um, actually we had this discussion uh, because in our exhibition we will also show some algorithms, right? Yeah. And um, for example, Gottfried Jaeger has uh, made a, an edition of one of his uh, early so-called algorithms um, uh, about his uh, pinhole structures. So we're gonna show that one, and um, I remember I, I sold a few of those previously, and um, well, John, we had the discussion, what are we gonna do with uh, <laughs> your code? And um, I think it, one can look at it as a brush, like a, a painter's brush, or it can be a artwork, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, I think for us, for Matt and I, because we come from a pure software background, um, but we love to express ourselves, you know, and, and create things that we really think of ourselves, we think of that as the case, that we make code that makes the visual thing, so the code is our brush. And, uh, but, but certainly there are other approaches, for example, you know, this more curatorial approach, where it's like, I'm gonna use off-the-shelf GAN software, but then I'm really gonna do an amazing job 
curating what goes into it, and then the output will be fantastic. And that's, that's just a different, and that's kind of what's cool about and interesting about the neural network stuff is it, it gets you away, from, you know, if you, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to be like Matt and I, a bunch of, bunch of dorks, <laughs> you know, you can focus now again on like, on, on, on visual and, and the, you know, you, you, you can get back to that space while still doing something that's very technical and, and, and cool. Yeah, and, and this is a dorky uh, build on that, which is that um, I think what's interesting about a lot of the way that sort of contemporary machine learning works is not through beauty, it's through this kind of weird engineering hackiness. And so, you know, as people build the kind of layers for the neural nets, a lot of it is like they don't quite understand why certain numbers of layers work or why certain configurations work. It's much more of like an engineering mentality as opposed to a more traditional programming kind of a beauty uh, mentality. So there's a, there's a kind of interesting parallel there. I think. So David, you touched on a, a little bit earlier about um, AI. You don't have to be an engineer to start, but we've got one, two, three, four, five uh, white guys roughly the same age um, on a panel about AI art and, and one uh, female. Um, so is there something essential or, or uh, you know, that has to do with the technology, the expense, or we, did we just not get the proper mix on the panel? Or, you know, what are you seeing? <laughs> what, are, what are you seeing, David? Because I know you're sensitive and have, you know, thoughts uh, around this. Um, you know, what do people need to do to start with AI? Do I need a degree from MIT and to be like a, a white guy who's like over 40 years old or like... <laughs> <laughs> um, probably st statistically, that might be the case. Um, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it, it, it can't be the case. We, we have to change what the future of AI is going to be. Um, you know, part of the reason that I kind of re got re-excited about AI was because of my own sort of terror of what AI could be in the future. That, you know, the, there's a, a term that um, Farhad Manchu, who's the tech editor for the New York Times, he refers to as the Frightful Five. So it's the five biggest companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, whatever, Microsoft, that basically have all of our data. And so these are the companies which are essentially saying and steering where AI is gonna go into the future. And you know, my, my own personal sense was like, I can't change what Google is gonna be what they're going to change, what their new new businesses are going to be. You know, if I want AI to be more democratic, to be sort of uh, less colonial, um, I need to find some other way to shift what the future of the technology is going to be. And so, you know, I think that you know it's great to sort of do STEM programs where we educate more people and bring more diversity into these companies, but I think there's also a huge opportunity through outsiders and through creative expression and aesthetic experiences to get sort of a more uh, cultural sort of idea of what AI could be in the future. And so it's, it's through, I think through art and through the kinds of things that we're all doing here on the panel that that sort of gives us a new imagination for what the technology can be and hopefully you know, enables more people to participate in what that future is. That's what drives me crazy about some of the artists who I would consider almost charlatans who are smart enough to understand how AI works, but they buy into what the public wants, what the reporters want to hear about like the, the robot taking over the world uh, conspiracy stuff. Because really art, you know, and artists, in my opinion, artists is one of the reasons they're the most important throughout history is because they're less afraid and they embrace these new scary weird things for all of us, right? Um, and when you embrace a false narrative, um, and especially around something that people are afraid of, you're really kind of coming up short, I think, of, um, of filling that role um, that artists can fill. This AI art could just be an attack vector for the AI. This is where it all starts. It's true. I, I, it's I possible. was gonna say, you know, Kevin and I were talking about this earlier, that you know, so much around AI is about bigness and speed and kind of who's doing something bigger and better. And those are really the, the narratives that we're getting from kind of the big tech companies. Right. And we can, we, if, you know, through art, we can say AI can be slower. Yeah. AI can be smaller. It can be, so it doesn't have to be a, about consumption or efficiency. Imperfect even. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these massive, massive systems. Are well, Sharon, you were saying too that um, people immediately are like, oh, look at all of these really bizarre, scary, weird images. And you're like, well, they're not necessarily bizarre, scary, and weird. We can like look at them like in, in a different way, right? Right, like the media is always uh, uh, declaring them as horrifying and stuff like that, right? Horrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said before, like the, the robots are gonna take over the world and take our jobs, yeah. yeah. Exactly. 
So, uh, not going to take over our jobs, I don't think, at least anytime soon. It doesn't sound like it. The, usually, the, the people I talk to who know the most about AI are they're like, eh, it's just like augmenting like what we're doing and not freaked out. So. No, okay. because it's still slow and stupid. I mean, it's amazingly how slow it takes to train one of these systems. I mean, right. you think of AI as this all-powerful super thing, and it's just, it's. We just bummed out everyone here who was hoping that we were going to talk about like robots taking over the universe. We're like, <laughs> we're like, it's slow and it's stupid, um, but it does do this thing, you know. In, in talking, interviewing a bunch of these AI artists, there is this point where no, artists it is, using AI. What's that? Yeah, artists using AI. Oh, sorry. In interviewing these artists using AI, there is this black box point that they never get to talk about because it re, uh, sort of reassures this false narrative or whatever. But there, there are things that are going on that you guys don't even understand, right? Is that, is that fair? Can we talk about that a little bit? In the GAN? The black box. The, the, the idea that there are things going on um, in the GAN that, that aren't knowable. Yeah, I don't know if we can call it a black box. Like, I don't know if I agree with that. It's like, it's, it's like, kind of like an ecosystem of code, right? Like we, we code in layers of layers and we kind of, don't really understand what already, uh, what's changing what, or why firing what, but it's not really a black box. I mean, do yeah. you find yourself laughing sometimes at the result? Like, sometimes I'll see something like, wow, like, I would never, like, you know, we talk about these things thinking, you know, or, or acquiring knowledge. It's a completely different process, obviously, from the way we, we acquire knowledge, uh, I think. Um, and sometimes I, you see the result, and you're just like, oh, okay. That's interesting. I had a simple thing, my, my son, just quickly, my, my nine-year-old son at the science fair project, he says, Papa, I want to do something in AI. So we decided, okay, we'll train on a bunch of uh, photos of apples. We took a bunch of photos of apples, and I don't remember what we were going to do. It, it had something to do with image classification at first, but then I had this idea that whether well, are green and red apples. Now, is it going to be able to know which one? Oh, the idea was we we're going to convert all the color photos to black and white first, bring them back into the color realm. You know, there are APIs to, to do that. But will it know which are green and which are red? I thought to myself, okay, logically, uh, when it trains on enough data, it probably takes some sort of tonality, and if they're on this side of the tonal, tonal scale, they know it'll be green and the other ones will be red. But then, of course, all the photos had a shadow side. So how is it going to interpret shadows? And anybody who trains with, uh, with, with these GANs knows that shadows complicate things. And that's when it was really strange. It didn't know, it doesn't know that's a shadow. Uh, it just knows that there's this tonal shift, I guess. And so we ended up with these kind of marbleized green and red apples. And it just brought a smile to my face because just when you think you understand how these things think, you realize uh, you don't. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Fair. I just did a quick uh, time check and I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes. Is that fair, uh, Alain? Yeah? So yeah, let's, let's kick it to the crowd. Uh, who's got questions? You can. <laughs> you should have a mic. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, you want the mic? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> All right, question. Yeah, so I have a question here. Um, so looking at you guys, it seems like you all have a very strong background in engineering and computers uh, at the same time you're artists, but and you mentioned this earlier, I would argue that you are not representative of artists at large in terms of your background. Uh, so my question is about access accessibility to, uh, to AI, using AI as a tool. Uh, it seems to me that the cost to use it at the moment is pretty high, like the barrier of entry is pretty high. Uh, do you see this changing at some point? And just in general, what are your thoughts about this, right? Like, do you see having tools, like having a Photoshop for AI, for example? And if you had that, would AI generated with this tool be actually considered the same type of art that you guys generate at the moment with your models? Yeah. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm coding, but I'm not machine learning coder. So for that, for example, and uh, I work with uh, coders and uh, other people when I want to create projects. And now the project that I describe is a uh, is very big. So I work with a team, but uh, I I do have like other other platform that I see evolving, and we work on tools. And I see other people work on tools. So I I see this field growing as like a creative field for like uh, creative tools, like. There are a few amazing things that are already developing, yeah. 
Yeah, to add specifically to that, uh, Runway ML, right? Yeah. So Runway ML is essentially photo, uh, AI Photoshop, right? So it's designed ground up to take all the latest and greatest research, academic research on AI um, algorithms, and make it available to other people. Based out of New York, Cristobal, Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's coming. And, and I think the second part of your question, when everybody on the planet can use these algorithms, is it just going to get boring like a Photoshop filter, right? Um, I, th I think what's, what we're starting to see is that um, it's helpful for the, the really talented AI artists because their stuff is still different. Even when we all get the algorithms, right, their work is still just like we could all have a paintbrush and paint, but we're not all going to be, you know, Michelangelo or whatever, right? So it's beneficial to the artists who are actually good at this stuff that it's getting into other people's hands because you can differentiate what's, you know, why they're different and what they're doing. I don't know if you guys would agree can with I, that. I, I, I absolutely. I think, you know, the, the tools are going to get better, um, but to go back one step, um, you know, I come from a technical background, but I haven't coded until just recently for 20 years. Um, and I was interested in AI, and so what I did is I found, you know, websites and blogs, sort of to the point that you were talking about earlier, that said, here's the steps that you need to go through to get this code running, and it would have links to the GitHub place, it would have, you know, instructions on how to set up an account on Amazon to do the processing, which can actually be quite inexpensive when you're first starting out, like, you know, a couple dollars a day. Um, and simply by following those instructions and not doing any code at all, but having a, a sort of a sense of like, you know, I can just follow these, these instructions and I'm, I'm not gonna be scared of the technology, I was able to feed it images um, first from sort of the common repositories of whatever ducks or things they are, there are, that are out there and then begin to put my own images in uh, and just substitute that, that out. And it was, it was quite easy once you sort of figured out what the steps are to do. And so I would say, you know, although we all have some sort of technical proficiency, um, it's, not, it's not a requirement to do this stuff. Also, if I can ha add, uh, I started like three years ago with like just reading a lot of research because academia has tons of data sets and it's beautiful how much it's accessible. So I like one of the things that they are showing here is a tool that I started to develop out of just like research that I, so I read a lot, so that's also a lot. Right, thanks. Thank you. Another question? Oh, we got a question here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, when you, when you feed visual images uh, in, into AI and have, have it generate artwork, are there any intellectual property concerns with the original images, even though they aren't representative in the final artwork? Yeah, so I've talked to a lot, maybe a lot more lawyers than you guys. Maybe you talked to lawyers too. I don't know. I talked to the, the woman who runs a cyber law clinic at Harvard, and uh, she's got, I'll, I'll pitch Art Gnome here. Uh, we did a long interview, and she goes in depth on a lot of this. She basically says that if it's a lot of the same artist, um, you know, if you're using 100 works by the same artist, she thinks that, uh, that there could be problems because all the training material cam came from the same person. But it's a little bit, which is interesting because you would think law would be kind of specific. I've talked to probably five or six different sets of lawyers and every single one says something different, which is why I was kind of talking about maybe black box is the wrong term, but there's a thing that's happening in the middle that people don't fully understand yet, so it's hard for them to govern it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that really gives you an answer other than asking you to go read my blog. But well, it's, um, it's, it <laughs> seems like the early days of hip hop when people would sample with no problem and then all of a sudden there was a, a point where it became a legal issue, you know? Like, I will, yeah, I think you're right, and I will say, and I don't know if you guys agree with this, but the, the artists that I talk to laugh at it, right? They basically say all these things that the lawyers are writing show that they have no idea what's going on. I think this one woman, Jessica Field from Harvard, might be one of the exceptions, but um, there are a lot of lawyers racing in to want to weigh in on this stuff, because again, anytime you say AI, the, the readership goes up. Most of them, it doesn't seem like they really know what they're doing. And, and we know from experience that, that the, the entities that have the, the most leverage and the most money and the most to lose will probably help shape legislation. Right. So one, just one more question. Is sure. the, um, when you create a work of art, uh, is, do you usually uh, like let on what the original data was that led to that? Or is that kept secret? or? Like citing your sources kind of yeah, a thing? Yeah. Do, do you guys cite your, well, I think I'm, Yeah, I mean, I, from, for me personally, I'm using images that I take myself, mm -hmm. and they're all images from my farm in upstate New York, partly to also contrast the nature right. of nature versus big tech. Um, 
and I have shown a sample of those images so people can kind of get a sense of how similar and how different they are. Um, but it's a, it's a good question because I think sometimes some of the AI, the art made with AI, um, has a kind of gimmicky quality to it. Like, you know, they train it on all of the, you know, churches in England or something. Um, and so I, it, I think it depends a little bit on how unique the art is. I mean, I think your point around how you, you did your nail series is interesting. Yeah, I train on my own, my own data set. But I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there have been derivative works. There have been a lot of, you know, artworks that are clearly derivative, satirical. Well, satire is a whole thing unto itself. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just open, open to debate. Again, I think it really comes down to how big are the lawyers and how big are the, the, the moneyed entities behind who yeah, are you can fight making their case. Yeah. Yeah. I think our panel is unique in that everyone, as far as I know, kind of rolls their own here. Um, whereas, uh, you know, like a Mario Klingeman or a Robbie Barrett, those folks are pulling from massive data sets on, online. They might weigh in on something like that. Uh, any other questions? Oh, we got one in the front row. Thank you. Um, this is a fascinating panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of on the generative side of things and conceptually kind of how you're, you know, coming up with um, the artwork and the concept. I'm interested in kind of the, the other side of that as well in the marketplace and kind of what the reception has been from traditional collectors or institutions, um, curators, um, and kind of what you're putting out there and how that's being received commercially and, and in kind of the fine art marketplace. Yeah, I'll give this one to George maybe to start. Well, I, I, I can talk about the generative photography maybe because that's the market I was working in uh, when I used to have a gallery. And certainly at the beginning it was uh, something very new and uh, for most curators and collectors um, they had to read a few books to understand what it's about. But I was quite surprised that I was selling to collectors who had Picassos on their wall <laughs> and, and Kenneth Nolan and I mean like it was, it was really strange that they got fired for it and I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a question of education so um, it's, it's, it's yeah I mean it's, it's not a type of art which is uh, <laughs> easy recognizable like Damon Hirst and um, you don't need to read many books to understand it. Uh, I mean most of the artworks have a, a very interesting concept behind it and if you take the time to learn about it uh, you catch fire and uh, we managed to um, get a, quite a few really important collectors to buy these artworks but uh, I, th I think uh, it needs more. I mean, it, I believe the we we need more dealers, no more cu curators. I, th I think what we noticed last year was that because it was kind of like 50 years anniversary of of um, cybernetic serendipity and, and all these computer art uh, movements. Um, uh, there were a lot of exhibitions. Um, I was surprised how many <laughs> there were. Like. I think I counted at least 10 exhibitions um, that were showing these early computer art works from the 60s. Uh, there was an exhibition in the MoMA, in the Whitney, um, in the Centre Pompidou, in the Grand Palais, there was an exhibition on robots and uh, VNA, etc. So, and I realized there is some interest for this. And uh, actually, we did a, uh, yeah, a blockchain art exhibition last year in Zurich at Kate Voss Gallery. And um, we showed like the CryptoPunks, for example, and some works by Kevin. And uh, it, it was, there was a lot of interest, a lot of interest, a lot of new collectors. So I think especially the new generation of collectors, they are looking into this stuff. And they understand it more than m maybe uh, a traditional collector, but uh, I had, uh, I don't know, I had um, collectors visiting, they were like over 80 years old and they were interested in the CryptoPunks. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I would just add to that. My pet theory is that um, in the 80s, if you used computers, you were a nerd, right? I grew up in a family of engineers. We're all nerds. Now we all use computers. So we're at this threshold um, in history where computers isn't a weird thing that just a few of us do. It's like maybe one of the things that we all do that actually brings us together that we have in common, right? So I think we're, we're at a, a tipping point where the market's going to grow. I'm pretty bullish on you know, investing in, in digital art and generative art in particular. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add Saying about. you're a nerd is such a hipster thing. Well, <laughs> saying I'm a hipster is such a nerdy thing, though, right? Uh, do we want to throw in one more? Uh, yeah, we got one more question. Just one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about how this art form is developing globally, and particularly in Asia. Do you have, can you speak to that? AI art in Asia, anyone have, uh, that's, a, that's a blank spot for me. It seems like it'd be a sweet spot for them, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, I know on Twitter a few folks I follow, so G Google um, advances a lot of this technology and there are a couple of folks I follow closely on Twitter that I know are very heavily involved on a research side. Um, but I don't know that they would call themselves AI artists. You guys have any off the top of your head? I, I missed exactly the question. I mean, I just got back from Hong Kong, and there was a lot of interest in, in my work that deals with AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just there for uh, Art Basel. But artists and other, I mean, you know, obviously Europe, there's like Mario Klinsmann and folks like that, but... Uh, in, in Tokyo, there is David Hu. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, but he's doing a lot of reinforcement learning uh, art with Google Brain. He's in a hard, hard Maru on Twitter, that yeah. guy? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, awesome. yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, a lot I think of brain, brain research and reinforcement learning. Less GAN, I think. Less GAN, yeah. less GAN and more research. Yeah. So, I think the real answer to your question is that probably a lot of folks, just we don't know as many of them, uh, but we know some. So, yeah. And I think that's it, right? Yep. All right, thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. <laughs> thank you.